What's up, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. We are coming to you on a bit of an unorthodox schedule because of the Christmas holiday. Uh, I'm Scott Baer, Tori, and Ashton are with me via Fancy Technology. Because we enjoyed the Christmas holiday with our families, we hope that you enjoyed it with yours and had a pleasant December 25th doing whatever you were doing. Even if that meant, like me, you watched three consecutive games of football and ate more than his body weight in carne asada. So, um, <laughs> that's uh, very specific. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have this tradition because we're from San Diego. So we do oh, yeah, this right. San Diego specific meal as homage to our kind of past or whatever. So um, that was fun. Tori, did you have a good Christmas? I did. Spent it with my family up in Chickamauga. So I'm I'm feeling good. I'm, that's actually where I'm recording from right now in my family's kitchen. So and, there's there's just a lot. <laughs> yeah. And Ashton, you're still in the still in the ATL yep. with uh, your fam, right? How was your yep. Christmas? Still in Atlanta. Uh, Christmas is great, man. We had a, a nice seafood booth. I watched some NBA and NFL games, man. So it was it was really chill and nice to be with the family. Yeah. So normally we normally we record this podcast right after the game is over with the emotions and the stats and everything fresh in our minds. But given what happened and given the delay in recording the podcast, rehashing a game that was two days ago, a game that didn't go well for the Falcons and actually formally eliminated them from the playoffs, we figured one, we didn't really want to rehash that game. I don't necessarily know that you want to rehash that game. So we came, we put our brains together, our mighty IQs, and came up <laughs> with a new plan. And it's this. Uh, we're going to try to spin this thing forward a little bit using a question that was asked of uh, head coach Arthur Smith at the very end of his post-game press conference, and it was this. What do you want – now that the playoffs are out of the picture, formally and mathematically out of the picture, what do you want to see from your team – over the next two weeks? And I think that's a good question worth pondering. His immediate answer was he wants two things. He wants to see progress and he wants victories. If we only said that and stopped the podcast, the sponsors probably wouldn't be happy. So we're going to go ahead and expand on that a little bit uh, and dive deeper into what we want to see from certain positions, from certain players. And that idea was not mine. I went over to atlantafalcons.com. I read Tori McElhaney's Amazing story on uh, wow. <laughs> I on the record, I yeah. told Scott when I was writing it, I was like, "This is like." N-. There are some days I think, as journalists, you write things that you're like, "Wow, I am so good at my job. Like, this <laughs> is so good." And then there are other things that you write, and you're just like, "This isn't good. Why am I doing this?" I feel like everybody probably has that feeling in everybody their has job. Those days. Yeah. Everybody just happens to read ours. So I told Scott, I was like, this is so not good. And then he goes and makes an entire podcast just about this story. Am I doing it just to bother you a little bit? Maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, but I was, uh, but I was inspired by the idea. It wasn't as bad as you think it was. It never <laughs> is. Um, and, but anyway, so Tori's going to kind of guide us through this because as Falcons fans, sure. Like you can dream about a draft pick. Right. But then they're not going to take that draft pick for months and months and months. Right. We're talking right. about immediate analysis, what fans can look for, where there are problem spots as Terry Fontenot and the fan base and Tori Scott and Ashton continue to compile an off season priority list about what they need to get done with more than $70 million in cap space, some pretty good draft capital. Now there's only one list that matters and that's Terry's right. Ours doesn't right. as much, but that won't stop us from talking about it. So Tori, what did you kind of identify as you were watching that Ravens game and you looked at some different positions that may have been weaker or may have raised an eyebrow or prompted some uncertainty um, what did you kind of think that the Ravens game showed you about the Falcons and what they need to address moving forward? Yeah. So I starting off just kind of like what you're talking about, setting the scene, knowing kind of what the Falcons have at their disposal come the start of the league year and how realistically they could have between 80 and $90 million in cap space, which would be in the top, three cap spaces in the league. And that's the first time that we're saying this about this Falcons organization in a very, very long time. They took over $80 million of dead cap money on the chin in order to be 
in 2022 in order to be in a better financial situation in 2023. So all of that being said, you would think that they would have not just the draft capital, but also just the monetary value of having more space in the salary cap to make significant moves in free agency, probably be in conversations with, in the trade market, and then also have a pretty relatively, you'd hope, good draft class. So all of that being said, looking at this loss to Baltimore, I, I kind of was just sitting there in the press box and I told Scott, even as the game was kind of coming to an end, I was like, I don't want to write about this game. I have to push it forward. Like, I, that's just what we're going to do. And so I kind of broke it down into three offensive positions and three defensive positions that I feel like the Falcons, you know, should prioritize in the off season, whether that be via free agency, a trade, the draft, whatever. So y'all want to, y'all, which, which side do you want me to start with? Oh, you know, I want, Offense or defense? I want to start with the most premium position on the planet. How about that for alliteration? Let's go straight defense, to the signal interior caller. defensive line. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's it. That's the one. <laughs> Definitely not the, the one with the uh, low numbers and the guys who throw the ball around. Yeah. Why don't, I right. mean, like, that's, you know, no, like no, that's no. What, we'll start with offense. Yeah. And I mean, like we're going to talk quarterback a lot during the off season, but I, I do think it's relevant now and it will continue to be relevant moving forward. So let's start with Des. Let's start with quarterback situation. We still have two more games in which we are going to get more evaluations of him. I mean, we still need to see more of him. I, I do think, I believe Arthur Smith and Desmond Ritter, when they were talking about that, there was progress from Desmond Ritter's first start to his second start. I think you saw him be a little bit more comfortable in the pocket. I didn't think that he had as many happy feet moments is what I was calling it after that first game. Um, but there's still, there's still two games that you can really have at your disposal to decide what you want to do with Desmond Ritter moving forward. And if you want to give him a shot as a starter in 2023, however, even in saying that quarterback has to be a priority for this organization, this off season, I think it goes without saying that right now, the only two people that are in this quarterback room are Desmond Ritter and Logan Woodside, who was just picked up what a week and a half ago and Marcus Mariota was placed on IR. Um, I think the Falcons, this is just me saying this, but if you cut Marcus Mariota before June 1st, you have significant cap savings upwards of $12 million. So I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to, you, you do with that information what you will. So what could the Falcons do at the quarterback position? Well, they just need to build it back up. And I, I think you need to do that regardless of, what Desmond Ritter does in the next two games, what he shows you in the next two games, you need to build up this room with, in my opinion, another starting caliber guy. You need someone, if it's going to be Desmond Ritter as your 2023 starter, fine. Go out and get someone who's going to push from behind him. If it's not going to be Desmond Ritter, you need a starter. So either way you slice it, to me, quarterback has to be a priority this offseason and in whatever capacity that looks like. Ashton, so, uh, that, yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and I don't think that you're wrong. I mean, just if we're talking about sheer numbers, they need quarterbacks. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think competition never hurts. Uh, Ashton, kind of getting into what Desmond Ritter said at the end of that Ravens game and then try to spin it forward for us here that, that he talked about the progress that – he saw between, and, and you wrote about the progress seen between weeks one and two, kind of tell us what that was. And then also what else do you want to see from him over the next two weeks that would show you that he's headed in the right direction? For sure. Yeah. Desmond talked a lot about just being patient within the pocket, something that he wasn't in uh, week 15 against the saints. And he felt like he took that next step um, in week 17 against the Ravens. Um, I would say his passing percentage. He was he he was 16% higher in his passing percentage against the Ravens, and he threw 121 more yards than he did um against the Saints in the Ravens game. So I think his passing efficiency was was way better against the Ravens, but we still haven't seen him throw a touchdown yet. Um he still he doesn't have any turnovers, which is really good from Desmond um and from a rookie quarterback. He's played against some really good defense over the last two weeks, the Saints and the Ravens. So I think that says a lot about his playing style and his character as a quarterback. But 
Um, I think we need to see him score and make plays in a red zone. Um, that it was a lot of inefficiency in a red zone against the Ravens. And, you know, I think that's what hurt the Falcons. Um, they lost by eight points. You know, they they should have scored a touchdown and, and brought the game back, um, but they didn't. So I think what I want to see from Desmond moving forward is really just being more efficient in red zone situations, because I think that's that's what's been a, a big struggle for the Falcons offense. Yeah, and he starts slow. We've seen that. I think he was, what, one for four in this game, and then he got hot in the second quarter. I thought there were there were more upward signs from him in that Ravens game than I had seen from Marcus Mariota in ways that I could project moving forward. It's encouraging, right? But is he going to do something against Arizona and Tampa Bay that says, uh, we're just going to go find the best backup that we can find? Is that going to happen over the next two games? I don't think so. I really don't. And I think that goes back to the level of, of competition. And it's not Desmond Ritter's fault or he didn't do anything wrong. He's a rookie quarterback who has four games to show what he can do. And I don't care which rookie that you look at. There's tons of Hall of Famers that struggle when they started and didn't get revved up for a little bit. And those things happen. He's, you know, kind of thrown into a tough situation. I say all that to say this is that if you're sitting there at whatever draft spot that you have and quarterbacks, the best player available on your board and you fell in love with somebody, take them. Right. And then don't worry about it. Or if you (laughs) feel, I mean, like Desmond Ritter, in my opinion, no matter what he does, cannot complicate that equation in your brain, right? That if you get there and you're at, I don't know, four, I'm just using a crazy example. You're at four. I don't even know if they can get to four, but you're at four and somehow, some way Bryce Young like slips to four and you love him, take him. That's it. End of story. If you're at eight or 10 and you have, and there's a quarterback sitting there, take him. If it's not, don't stress and don't reach. And I think that that's kind of where they are. There's also a trend these days, right, of making big veteran quarterback moves that we've seen. Yes. <laughs> How much have we seen moving? So you know, many in the so last many. like five years, there have been so many trademark blockbuster veteran quarterback moves. And some so of them many. worked and some of them have not. Right. Yeah. I.e. Denver. <laughs> right. I.e. Denver. I.e. Washington. I.e. We we love Matt, but that didn't work yeah. out in Indianapolis. Right. right. The the Falcons won that trade. Yeah. Let's just say it. So I, you do have to be cautious with what you're getting, but there are always possibilities in the trade market and moving people around. The Falcons have the space to absorb a highly paid veteran quarterback while also not sacrificing their future. That's the financial spot that they're in. So um, I think the major takeaway here from this quarterback conversation is all options are on the table. And that's not normally, I think when a fan hears that, they think, well, Desmond stinks or he hasn't been good enough. That's not what we're saying. No, I, no. I think Ashton brought up some some good points about ways that he's made progress and areas where he needs to continue to make progress. Oh, for four in the red zone is a problem, right? right. It just, but is. that's a, I would say like, that's, that's a, a team problem, problem too. Sure. Too. Yeah. One, like yeah. 100%, but you know, the, the quarterback as, you know, a figurehead of that unit, I think yep. needs to be better. And, but no matter what he does, even if he goes out and he throws for 400 against Arizona and four touchdowns against Tampa, I still don't think it changes the math enough for you to be uh, wary of going out and making a major quarterback commitment. So um, I think that that's one area, uh, you know, there's going to be some, there's a possibility that they lose Caleb McGarry in free agency, but he and Chris, Chris Lindstrom have been so stable. Tori, you chose to focus on uh, some skill positions. Why don't we just combine those? Yeah, absolutely. Cause I honestly, I think when it comes, I didn't put offensive line on that, list because I feel like there's a lot of different factors within the offensive line that I think the Falcons actually have a really, really good group right now that if they could keep together, I wouldn't hate that. So I didn't actually put offensive line on this list for that reason. Now to the other side of things, I did put a couple skill spots and it's not running back because I think you have something really, really good in Tyler Algier, 
Tyler Algier and Cordero Patterson. I focus more on wide receiver and tight end. And I think those are two positions that you could go out in free agency and really be players in those positions. And I say free agency because you spent two of your first round draft picks on Kyle Pitts and Drake London over the last two years. Do you really want to go skill a, for a third year in a row while this quarterback position is in flux? That's kind of the question that I played with. So, But I do think you could go out and you could in free agency and find some really, really good tight ends to fill up behind Kyle Pitts. You need, I think, because of the way that Arthur Smith operates his offense with so many multiple tight end sets that you could really use another kind of big play pass catcher type tight end. Not that there's anything wrong with what Parker Hesse and Anthony Ferkser and Michael Pruitt did this year, but when Kyle Pitts went down, it, you, you, I mean, you're never going to replace Kyle Pitts just with one singular person. And so I think finding someone to kind of pair well with Kyle Pitts at that position is should be a priority. I also think looking at this wide receiver group, you have Drake London and you have Alameda Zacchaeus, and that kind of feels like it. And I, I just feel like you could use some guys. I, I use this example, and I want to say this it was an example, but guys like a – T. Higgins or a Tyler Boyd that the Falcons faced um, earlier in the year when we went up to Cincinnati, those type of receivers. I'm not saying go out and get those two guys. I'm saying that's kind of the prototype thought process that I have of like, what is a good looking receiver that would work well in this system? Um, so that's those those two positions I I put I wrote quite a bit about and that's kind of basically the summer summary of that <laughs> yeah um when you look at wide receiver depth one i'm not sure any buddy is under contract outside of drake london right yeah right so they have an opportunity there and I, I think what we saw against baltimore and what we've seen since kyle pitts has gotten hurt is that there is a lack of depth there 100 yeah. percent. and yes desmond has a strong chemistry and connection with Drake London, but the, but the target share that he's getting is sky high and it's appropriate because he's the one who can consistently make, who can get separation, who can make high traffic catches. And we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. And I look, I talked to Drake after the Ravens game and I said, can you separate the fumble from, and he's had two fumbles in two weeks. Can you separate the fumble from all the other good things that you did? And I kind of liked his answer because his answer was no. He said the fumble ruined everything else. That and I and and I know that it's right after the game, right? Like I get right. that. And he had to. He had, I'm not rehashing the game here, but he did things technically right. And then he cut his sleeves off because he thought his sleeves had something to. He he called. He he called that that fumble the last straw for his sleeves. So maybe we don't see him anymore, especially maybe in, we never see the sleeves again. It's 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 very. <laughs> they could go on and have a very like prosperous um career sand sleeves yeah and i think which, he will uh -huh. i don't i'm not worried about drake london i'm no. not yeah it's it's filling in around that and they've done it for the last couple of years i remember getting to this point after calvin was unavailable where you looked around in that wide receiver room no offense to tajay sharp right but th those guys just couldn't get separation and right. uh, alameda is a good player he's a good piece but you definitely need more of those I mean, gosh, you go back to the off season and the Falcons were like building a basketball team right now. Right. It's not like and none have, of them worked out and none, none of, of them, them worked out. So you do right. need to take um, another swing there. Uh, Ashton, when you look at what Alameda Zacchaeus has done, right. He had a strong connection with, with Marcus Mariota. I th I think he's a good player. Um, is that a guy from what you've seen, if you're playing uh, GM, do you go ahead and bring him back? And do you kind of understand what Tori's talking about that? Look, they have Kyle Pitts, they have a fleshed out tight end room, but maybe, uh, maybe they need more there considering how this offense runs. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what Tori said. Um, I, I think you do look at a guy like uh, Lamade Zacchaeus. He's been, I would say he's been very consistent and efficient over the course of this season. Uh, he's a veteran. So he, he, he has a lot of that veteran leadership and, and veteran experience within the game. Um, but I do think you should look at that position specifically because Drake London is the only, I would say the only challenge really against defenses that the Falcons have played. He's the only player that has amassed over 70 plus yards in the last three games. Everybody else has probably, I think only caught for maybe 20 or 
less yards. And I think that's a problem. Like defenses pick up on that. And I think we saw it in the Ravens game. It looked like Drake London sometimes were was getting double teamed. And that and you know, you need other players to step up. The Bengals, like Tori said, they have Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, um, and, and those dynamic wide receivers. You need somebody opposite of Drake London um to, to be really electric and efficient. Um, and I think OZ has done, like I said, I think he's been consistent, but I think because he he has that experience, he should be a little more um, of a challenge against defenses. Um, but I, to answer your question, I, I do think the Falcons should look at bringing OZ back. He's a great, great piece to the offense. And, um, you know, I think he'll bring a lot of depth next season. Yeah, I, I will think, say this too. Arthur uh -huh. Smith loves OZ. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. If, if there's one thing we, I feel like we've learned about Arthur Smith. It's like if he gives somebody crap about something, he really likes them. And he gives OZ crap about going to Virginia all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when I look at it, I think Ashton brings up a good point. Outside of Drake London, who scares you? Yeah. And it's silence, right? Be, right. Uh, who, who, who makes a, an opposing coordinator go, all right, we got to do some funky stuff for that guy. We got to leave ourselves vulnerable to make sure that that guy doesn't beat us. And I think that Alameda gets better when the wide receiver room gets deeper, right? If he's yeah, the, or you have Kyle Pitts on the field. Yes, 100%. So when you add Kyle Pitts back, that's, that's another guy that definitely scares you. And I yeah. think that he and Drake can be a good one too, but adding another guy who actually plays wide receiver, I think is important. Also yeah. when, when I, and when it comes to tight ends, I don't necessarily want to see like, I mean, Kyle Pitts, like there's few people like him, but I don't want to see a guy who's like receiver forward. I want to see like a balanced guy who can get 450 yards or something like that. Yeah. Um, and those are the types of things that I think that you could really identify. And look, as we, I mean, Tyler Huntley can move around the pocket. Pressuring him isn't easy, but for the second straight year, the pass rush is ranked among the worst in the league. And I think that that has been evident while the Falcons have done a good job on critical downs and have stayed in these games. And we're not, we're not going to sit around and rip this defense. Uh, I, th no. I think <laughs> Dean Pease cares about one thing, uh, preventing points from being scored. And they've done yeah. a good job of that. I um, they've allowed what less than 25 in every game of the last, what, six, Seven. Seven. Thank you. And they've only won one of those. That's not a positive. They lost a game in Baltimore after allowing 17. And they lost to New Orleans after giving up two early scores and then clamping down. They've done well on critical downs. That doesn't mean that we're just like ready to roll with this crew next year, right? right. There needs to be upgrades, in my opinion, especially in the front seven. That's where we're, we're going to spend most of the, of the time focusing um, as we kind of look to, you know, condense this thing here a little bit, Tori, because look, they need help at outside cornerback. They're going to get Casey Hayward back. I would continue to add depth there, but let's really focus on that front seven and what you saw against Baltimore that kind of said, Oh, they need more here. They need more there. Absolutely. So I, let's start with the interior defensive line. Grady Jarrett's not going anywhere. Nope. He shouldn't go anywhere. Grady Jarrett has had a really good year, despite what I think a lot of outside people have said or not said about him. Yeah. Um, not said, I think I, like, I don't, I am going to stop you there. Cause I, cause I think this is an important point because Grady Jarrett has six and a half sacks. He's been instrumental in every victory and in keeping these guys close, but you know, he's not getting a ton of respect. He was very upset with words we can't use on this podcast talking about the disappointment of exiting the playoffs. So let's just, before we get into everything else, I do think that Grady Jarrett should be respected more league wide. He's on a team that's not very good, but let's talk about a little bit about what he's done as a leader um, this season. You know, I, I, th I just think he's been phenomenal as a leader and an on field uh, producer. Yeah, no, no, I completely agree. I mean, Grady Jarrett is the type of guy who I don't think, here's the thing is, it, it's really, when you watch Grady Jarrett play, when you really watch him play, you see, even if he's not getting a sack, even if he's not getting a tackle for a loss, he is making things happen for this defense because he's getting double triple teamed at times. Now, the, what the Falcons need to do, and it's the same conversation as what we had last year, 
we need to see the Falcons go out and build up this defensive line around Grady Jarrett. And I think they did a good job of that by adding, I, I think Taquan Graham's development has been something that has flown under the radar in, in this year. And I, I think he's coming back and after, you know, now he's on IR, but should come back after that knee injury and, and hopefully he'll be at the level that he left. And I think that's another really good piece. You go out and you get Arnold Ebicati, who I think, again, has had really good developmental moments. You've seen glimpses and flashes of the guy that the Falcons traded up into the second round to get. So all of that being said, they've done they've done the work up until this point, but the work's not done. So for me, you, you I need to see depth across the defensive interior. And what's really interesting is the Falcons tried to do that this year. You know, like if you look back on the moves that they made in the off season and the, the group they had put together within this defensive interior to help out Grady Jarrett, it was actually a pretty good group. But the only ones that are left is Grady Jarrett. He's the only one that's left. Everybody else either retired, got hurt, got cut. I mean, th th this, this defensive interior position has really gone through it in 2022 so it's going back to the drawing board and being like okay we just have Grady Jarrett right now you hope you'll get to Quan Graham off of IR and he'll be back to normal but outside of that you had Abdullah Anderson Jalen Dalton and Timmy Horn nothing against those guys but those guys were fighting for roster spots in August you don't need a guy who's fighting for a roster spot you need a guy who's proven in this league and who can come in and make a difference immediately and same thing goes for the edge rusher position as well. You, I would love to see the Falcons go out and get a really good veteran edge rusher whose stat line and history in the league strikes fear into opposing offensive linemen every single time he's on the field. That's my spiel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Ashton, how do you take a look at at the younger uh, edge rusher specifically, Eva Katie and D'Angelo Malone, who's mm -hmm. kind of been a work in progress, but um, nonetheless, you know, kind of evaluate what you see from those guys. For those who don't know, Ashton was also an edge rusher, so he should know a little bit <laughs> uh, about this. Um, how do you view those guys? Um, and, you know, also, I think, as to Tori's point, that they still need to add there. Yeah, I, I think um, Arnold Ebicady and D'Angelo Malone have both, like, I think they're, they both progressed well over the course of this season. Um, but I, I do think that they haven't made enough plays this season. Um, you know, I think Ebby Katie ranks in the top 10 for uh, rookie outside linebackers in, in sacks. Um, but D'Angelo Malone, he's only had, I think he only has one, one sack this season. Um, and, and like Tori said, you need somebody on the outside that is, is going to cause pressure and is going to be a threat on the outside. I grew up watching James Harrison and he was, Every I feel like every offensive line was was scared of James Harrison. Let's, right. let's you know, let's just be honest. Um, and you need I, like they're rookies, but again, you still need those guys to um, come off the edge a little bit faster, a little more electric, a little bit stronger um, to to make quarterbacks nervous. And 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 that's just what it is. Um, just to go back to Grady Jarrett's point um, earlier in the season, Dean P said, you know, if if you saw pro in a dictionary, Grady Jarrett's name would be behind that. Um, comes to practice every day. He comes to games every day, works his butt off and, and does what he does. And you do need somebody on the opposite side of Grady Jarrett to cause havoc. And um, again, nothing against Timmy Horn, Abdullah Anderson and, and Jalen Dalton. But like Tori said, the, these guys were fighting for a roster spot. Um, and, you know, they gave up, I think, 150 plus yards in the last three games in rushing. Um, and that's that's just something that the Falcons can't do because teams have been breaking down this defense for a long time. And I, I do think you need more solid guys up up front in that interior defense. It's so interesting that that you brought up James Harrison. And here's why I was about ready to make a point uh, using my time covering the uh, San Francisco 49ers as an example. Right. Because they have created this harrowing defense right um and it's built off of first round draft picks who are defensive linemen and then you look at james harrison right and i think he was undrafted um uh, but, <laughs> but but uh but nonetheless uh, i'm not going to scour his wikipedia page to make sure that that's correct but nonetheless um when you look at the defensive lines that really scare you 
and I think defensive lines that the Falcons have played, just seeing them personally, I think of the talent, and we didn't even see Chase Young, but the talent collected along Washington's defensive front, so a lot of first round picks right there. The mm-hmm. San Francisco's defensive front was banged up, but if you look at it, what they've drafted, uh, Bosa, Kinlaw, Armstead, and Buckner, who's now with Indianapolis, but nonetheless, that they have gotten quality from those top spots. Just because you draft and a defensive lineman high doesn't mean that you're going to get a quality guy. But I think that this right. is one of those positions where you need to address it with every available asset that you have. Young went yeah. through the draft and veterans. I think a good veteran nose tackle, just a big body dude who can be right over the, you know, right over the center sometimes is what like would be helpful. And that guy who scares you in terms of how you're going to spend your money, you look at premium positions and it's cornerback, quarterback, edge rusher and receiver in my opinion and tackle yeah. obviously, but nonetheless, you need to go out and get people that scare you because as we've said, and as we've discussed, that isn't happening enough. And intimidators are typically focused on defense. But I think that as we wrap up this this podcast, we can all agree because we were talking about Drake, right? Drake scares you. Kyle yeah. scares you. Who else? That's the thing that the Falcons yeah. need. They need to go find guys who make coordinators shake in their shoes. And there aren't yeah. enough of those guys around to um, really keep opposing teams off balance. So that's the lesson. Right. (laughs) I just came up with it. Um, (laughs) There we go. There it is. It is that we look at all these positions and I think what over the course of the next two weeks, right. That we need to see Arthur nailed it victories and progress, but I don't think anything that happens in the next two weeks is going to change our opinion about whether they need another edge rusher or not. Mm -hmm. Right. That the sample size of what we have had to this point is too big to all of a sudden be like, oh, uh, Lorenzo Carter finished with six sacks in the last two games. We don't need – or the, the Falcons don't need another edge rusher. So um, I think we'd say that about quarterback, and we can kind of really try to use our minds here and our microscopes and try to identify, okay, which pieces are where, which pieces can help you, and how to create the offseason priority list. The last – Falcons final whistle will just create the priority list. My goodness. The inspiration is coming from on high. Uh, <laughs> so there we go. Uh, Mr. Zoom is telling us that we need to get the heck out of here. We're not going to do what we did last time. We're literally, we went to like the final second. We were like watching it tick down. Um, literally 10 seconds. New yeah. record for us. Yeah. I said that we'd be out of here in 20 minutes. We were not. So Yes, we were. Yes, we oh, were. This has really? been going before we started recording. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, th- well then yay. Good. Uh, yay on yeah. us. Uh, so yeah. anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this thing right here. Thank you everyone for listening to the latest edition of the Falcons final as a podcast, please, 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 pretty, please with sugar or a Christmas tree star on top. <laughs> Rate re- review, subscribe to the Atlanta <laughs> Falcons podcast network. Why don't you? I'm Scott. I'm looking at Tori and Ashton. Thank you so much for sticking with us all year. We have two more episodes in this season. Stay tuned. Talk to you next week.